let's dive in. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we have the privilege of studying that Torah for Parshat Shemot as we open the new book of the Torah. Um, it can be found in the back of your stone chumash on page 1146, I believe. Yes. 1146. Um, as you'll know, or you may know, that there are actually two traditions for uh, which Haftorah should be read on Parsha Shemot. So we're going to do the Ashkenazi tradition, not just because we're Ashkenazim, but because the Sephardi tradition is one of the Haftorah that we read later. So we're we're okay. Um, but it, it's important to note that all of these Haftorah, um, again, are the goal of Haftorah, as as we'll as we always talk about, is to match the Parsha have some message, some meaning, some connection to the Parsha. And that isn't just, you know, some wordplay, although sometimes it is also wordplay. Um, and so we get that when it comes to uh, the Haftorah for Parsha Chamo, that there's a debate over which storyline you want to pick up, right? There are two storylines in the Parsha of Shemo, right? There's the storyline of the Jewish people, right? They go down to Egypt, they're enslaved, they cry out to God, um, do they believe Moshe? Do they not believe Moshe? Their experience, all of that is a storyline of one through line of the book of, of the book of the Parsha of Shemot. The other is the origin story, for lack of other term, the introduction to Moshe Rabbeinu, right? He's born, he's born early, he's hidden, he hits the, the Egyptian, he flees, he finds a wife. He uh, encounters the burning bush. Uh, he comes back. He has his doubts, right? There are two interwoven storylines. It's actually like a good TV episode, right? It's not just one storyline. It's like there are two connected storylines, plot A, plot B. I'm not sure which is which. And they sort of, you know, trade off from one to the other, right? So which one do you choose when you want to amplify a theme from the Parsha? So for the Sephardic tradition, they choose, uh, whatever we'll say, uh, plot A, the story of Moshe, the story of Moshe. And so their Torah is all about what? Where does their Torah come from? It should be in front of you. you. Just turn the page. Yahoo. Your Yahoo. Jeremiah. It's the origin story of Yirmiyahu, who is, we'll look at this when we see these Nebuot during the three weeks, who is the story of a prophet emerging that is most similar to Moshe. There's a lot of metaphors and similes and imagery that are used. That is also the Moshe imagery. Yirmiyahu is sort of um, uh, cut from the same cloth of Moshe intentionally. And so we read that because it's all about the story of cultivating the next Jewish leader, right? And so the Haftorah amplifies and foils the story of Moshe and Yirmiyahu, and there are things to be learned about that. At the same time, our Haftorah is actually about the sprouting and the flourishing of the Jewish people. We're following plot B, which is the storyline of how the Jewish people emerge in Egypt, flourish in Egypt, even under difficult circumstances, and ultimately leave Egypt. Um, and do they leave Egypt because they merit it, or they leave Egypt because they don't merit it, and they had to leave, right? Is Chuva process in this? All of that are parts that our Haftorah amplifies and talks about. And so right off the bat, when we see this division between the Haftorah of the, from the Smartic community, Ejot and Mizrach, and the Ashkenazi community, we actually see that there's an there's a there the difference in tradition is actually predicated on a really uh, important what we would say in halachic terms nikudat hamachloket right there's a point of departure between these two different things one is which storyline are we going to follow the Moshe storyline the individual blossoming of an individual leader or the national storyline and so we follow the natural storyline so that's just I just want to note that <coughs> excuse me. We're not going to talk more about the storyline of Yirmiyahu because A, we cover that in the summer when we get to the three weeks, and B, we're Ashkenazim. But I just wanted to highlight that so at least we know when we're flipping through, oh, what's going on here? Sometimes, you know, Aftor might start in a different place, but this is two totally different Aftorot, two totally different books, 
Um, and really predicate on two different storylines. And, and by the way, I'll just add, and I, I, I mentioned this before, so if you remember, you know, it's just good review. Excuse me. I don't know. Um, one of the interpretive methods for looking at how we understand, let's say, the primary um, theme that we're supposed to take from something is going to be looking at what the Torah highlights. So, for example, I give this example all the time. When we look at Mama Harsinai, we look at Theophany, the moment where God reveals to the entire Jewish people, there are different ways that you could, what, what's going on there? So there's, uh, you know, t t there's the text of the actual Ten Commandments, right? Thou shall not, thou must, thou do this, thou do that. <laughs> and not just that, the Mishpatim, the different laws that are provided, also all of that tie in uh, to that. So that, that's interesting. Sorry about that. Um, so I was saying, one of the things that um, in interpretive structure, when you get to the, the, the revelation, to Theophany, to Mama and Harsinai, so there are different ways that you can understand it, right? What's the primary message we should take it? Is it the laws? Is it the text? Or is it the context? Is it the experience of engaging with God? You could make an argument both ways. But over and over again, the, the, the Chazal, our rabbis, when they chose the Haftorah, they actually highlight the experience, right? Over and over again, when we read, when we read Mama Varsina, we read about the Ten Commandments on both later in the book of Shemot, we'll get to it, and um, uh, on obviously Shavuot, Shavuot morning, the choice of Haftorah is about the experience of standing before God. Right, the beginning of Yechesko, um, the Maisim Merkava of, uh, of, uh, of 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 Yeshayahu, um, all of those are chosen uh, to highlight the, this point. Right, that when we look at the experience of Mamet Harsinai of Theophany, part of what we're supposed to take from it isn't just the laws that we got, the dry experience of transmission of information from the ultimate lawgiver, the Almighty, to Moshe. It's actually the experience of standing before God, the experience of standing in the divine presence, the Shekhinah, that's what we're supposed to take from Har Sinai. That's what the Haftorah highlights, right? So the Haftorah actually, just by choice of what to to highlight, is an interpretive structure of sorts. And obviously here we have a debate under which one it is, right? So what our Haftorah is, Yishayahu, is uh, Yishayahu in particular, Chapter uh, 27, um, beginning verse, uh, the verse Vav, we'll see that that's a unique verse to choose, um, beginning verse Vav. And in general, Yeshayahu is, uh, this is a hard half Torah to read, part because you have to lay down some framework as you're trying to understand, and that will push you in two different directions. Um, uh, just diving into our Torah. So you have to make a certain question about what we're referring to. And we'll see that there are actually two divergent, there are more than two, but we're going to look at two divergent ways of looking at our Torah. One is going to be the opinion of Rashi, which sees this as sort of its own section and a rebuke of the Jewish people, but not too much. Whereas the Radak, the Barbanel and many others see this as a much more wonderful, wonderful vision of the of of the Jewish people, and therefore it's not negative at all. Um, and we'll we'll get to that in a second. Um, how many of you, many of you are following along in a stone chumash, right? So the the first verse, it's sort of we sort of jump in mid section to this Torah. We're not starting at the beginning of a chapter, um, and we're not even starting at the beginning of a section of a parshia, of a Misoratic break. We're actually starting a pasuk before the end of the Misoratic break. There's a big K, which means there's a break, there's a space between the end of pasuk vav, verse 6, and verse 7. Um, and this is uh, a, going to be something we'll come back to in a second. But the beginning of chapter uh, 27 is part of an image 
of a big um uh a big uh vineyard. By Yomahu, I'm reading it's it's before what we're talking about. I actually can share my screen for those who would like to see. And I can put it in English also. Thank you, Safaria. So this is chapter 26, verse 2. Actually, verse 1 is still part of the last chapter, the last vision. Um, and uh, that's not the right chapter. Sorry, I switched it to English, and it brought me back a chapter. Um, chapter 27, verse 2. Um, the first chapter, the first verse of chapter 21, of chapter 27, happens to actually be really connected to chapter 26. <laughs> Why is it in chapter 27? You have to ask the Christians who divided up the Bible this way. Um, but uh, but over here is very clear at the beginning. By Yomahu, on that day, Karen Cherem Alula, in that day, they will uh, sing of a, a, a vineyard of Hemer. Hemer either means delight, as it's translated here. It might also mean um, like a clay, like a... Like uh, like the red clay, that's the soil, which means it'll produce beautiful, beautiful um, uh, fruit grape that will turn to red wine. Ani Hashem Notsra, I am God who will watch over it, watch over her, meaning the kerem, the vineyard. Anula, um, they'll, they'll you know they'll call to it, they'll proclaim it, right? Meaning this is the Jewish people. Um, some sort of metaphor, either the Northern Kingdom or the, the Jewish people. Again, context from the broader book tells us that. Liragayim ash ash kena. At uh, moments, I will water it. You see over here, it says, I water it every moment. It's not what it says. It says, at moments, I will water it. You could either interpret this like uh, the Radak and uh, of Arbanel and others, but this is all very positive, right? And therefore, God will water it at every moment, as opposed to Rashi, who says, no, there are times God will water it if it's deserving. If not, not, right? It's more, could be more thing. Whatever, we'll, we'll get to that. All of this actually, we'll just jump back to one other point now that I have my screen shared. All this really ties to a much broader motif that uh, Isaiah uh, uh, Yeshayahu has, uh, which is this idea of having a vineyard, the vineyard being a metaphor for the Jewish people. In verse five, we actually get the beginning of this. And this is actually one of the reasons why when we're working off Torah, you don't get the full feel for the book. This is a theme, this is a motif that's throughout uh, Yeshayahu that he uses and he brings back up to use at different points. And knowing where it's coming up helps us understand each time it's being used. So over here, Ashira na lididi, Shira dodi, a song for my beloved, a song of my beloved Likarmo for his vineyard. Hermaya lididi, my 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 beloved, my my friend had a. Uh, it's not a beloved like a like a relation, like a um, husband and wife. BD means more like a close friend, like a Yadid Nefesh, like a very close, close friend. Um, the Karen Ben uh, Shaman had a beautiful vineyard in a, in a, in a, in a great hilly area terrain that was perfect. Um, what did he do? As you, uh, he guarded it, he broke the ground, he took away all the stones, uh, Natu Sorek, he uh, planted the, the proper vineyards, but even Migdal Betocho, and he built a, uh, a watchtower in it to protect it. He even created like a wine press right there that every can do. Kavula Sot Navim. He hoped it would yield choice grapes, great grapes, but yas, and what did it make? What did it make? It says wild grapes. It made bad grapes. It made spoiled grapes. Remember that we'll have in a couple weeks, two weeks, when we have the plague of the of the blood? 
that all the fish die and the 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 Nile gets disgusting, gets rotted, reeks. They're rotten. That's what we have over here. Those are the grapes that you had. And now dwellers of Yushalayim, it's unclear whether this is just the people as a whole or is uh, speaking to the prophet himself that he should judge. Judge between me and my kerem. What else should I do to my vineyard? Below a city bow that I haven't already done. Madua of... Uh, I hope that it would make yield grapes, but instead it made uh, rotten grapes. It made vayivas, right? It's this disgusting. Um, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do to my Karim. Asir, I'm going to take away the protection. I'm going to take away the gate I made and that uh, the walls so it can be trampled and destroyed. Um, just uh, skipping a little bit more uh, to the end of verse 6. It's a ve mehametar alav. I'm sorry. It's a ve mehametar alav matar. I'm going to command the 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 ananim. No, I'm sorry, Va'al, where am I? Avim. And on the um on the clouds, I'm going to command so that it doesn't bring rain. Meaning now we get to understand that this DD, this close uh relative, this close friend is God, right? The metaphor now is playing it out, but it's this this it's this long drawn out metaphor of basically God invested in the Jewish people, and the Jewish people turned out rotten. And so God is upset. This is at the beginning of Yeshayahu, where there's this is a rebuke of the Jewish people. Jumping back to our the beginning of our Torah, right? You can read this as the Radak and the Barbanel does, as this is all very positive. This is redemption, right? There's going to be a time where we are going to be redeemed, um, and God will instead of holding back the rain, I'm going to slaughter whatever you want. You want water? You can have water anytime, all the time, right? So you see sort of the reversal of this. All of that comes in, and those that come back from the redemption to Israel will be implanted, will take root. They will sprout, and they will do well. They will cover the whole earth with... Uh, with uh, with fruit, with fruit, right? We'll see that this is actually. Let's stop my share at this point because we're back to our uh, to our. <clears throat> you actually see that this will be uh, this idea of tenuva and tevuna, which means wisdom, is a uh, sort of homophone in this uh, Torah. We've talked about this last year, so I don't want to get too much into this. But that's a big point of Yeshayahu's point over here about knowledge, about knowledge. There's a ton to talk about with what we just saw, but it's really background to understanding our Torah. I just want to highlight one thing because I, I always think it's so important. So we read this metaphor that we just read, this vineyard that gets uh, planted by God. God took out the rocks and the stones and built a tower and the protector. This half Torah, that half Torah, that part is a rebuke of Uziah, Uziahu, right? And what is he known for, that king? The protector. He builds towers to protect the Jewish people. He works the land. He develops the vineyards. He cultivates uh, what is um, non, non-planting, inarable land and makes it arable. Right? Arid means you can plant it, right? I'm not confusing it. Or is it the opposite? I don't remember. But... Arable is you can plant, arid is dry. Oh, thank you. So he takes arid land and he makes it arable, right? He removes the rocks and he builds the things, right? He prides himself on that. And what is the prophet saying? You're doing bad. And not only that, who really makes the ground work? Who really builds the, the towers, the watchtowers? Imagine if like 
your entire platform is that, you know, you're going to provide health care and social security and security. And then someone comes and says, no, you don't do any of that. God does that. God provides health care. It's like a, it's part of the very clever rhetoric that the prophet is targeting, really attacking the king. You think you protect? No, God builds the towers. God provides the protection. And if God wants to take it away because God's angry, it won't rain and you won't have protection. Right? That's, by the way, back in the parak uh, hey, of Yishayel, which is important to recognize. There's, a, there's not just the literary idea of what uh, the prophet is saying, but the more that we understand the history, the more that we have both the archaeology and we couple, couple it together, what else we know from Tanakh and other sources, we actually see the brilliance of the prophet speaking over here, that the rhetoric is targeted to the person it's targeted for. Continuing on, because we're just beginning our Torah. So now we have this, this, this run up into our Torah, Break, pause, end of that, end of that piece. Now the next, these next verses also are subject to this debate of how do we understand what's going on here? This next verse, right, says the Ritak. All of this is the reversal of what we saw before. And so even when God needs to punish us, uh, punish us, has the beaten been as beat as the beater, right? Meaning, does the Jewish people who get punished, are they punished to the same degree as those that punish, that, that attack the Jewish people? In Keherik Harugag, Harugav Horag, does the slayer, does the, does the slayer suffer in Keherik, does the killed suffer killed like his killer? Meaning the Jewish people aren't, you know, it's 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 beautiful. The, the prophet is so clever with, you know, Yeshayahu was so his 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 rhetoric and the way he frames these sentences are really so beautiful. There's a there's a lyrical aspect to his uh, prophecies as well. Um and that's what he's saying over here is this notion. Does the does is the at least according to the Ritak, all of this is a reversal from what we saw in Parakei, where the Jewish people are sort of being attacked. Meaning, even when the Jewish people deserve to be punished, it's not as bad as they deserve, because God's protecting us, right? Vesasea, um, Rivana, right? This this word Vesasea is a uh, one of the more unique words in all of uh, Yeshayahu. Um, either, it, typically, it's translated. What do people have by measure? In measure, by measure. Anyone? What, what do people have? And in the over here, it has. Nothing. Assailing them. I'm not sure what that means. What do people have is the beginning of chapter of verse eight, chapter twenty-seven. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, Rabbi. Just in he in, in, in people have the English in front of them, correct the art scroll? Chapter yeah. 27, verse 8. Why do they translate the Sasa? According to the measure of sin. According to the measure of sin, exactly. So what does this word sasa mean? So it says many of the commentaries, which your comment your English commentary follows. It is short for sabisa. A measure, sa is a large and dry measure. Um, it's a very large dry measure. So sa sa, measure for measure. We have an idea. The Gemara in uh, Sota is the primary place where it talks about this. That minayin she'adam she'bemida modeid bo modin lo. 
that a person gets judged by their measure, right? We get punished, mida, keneg and mida, measure for measure, or the, the way I measure other people is the measure God uses against me. Mm-hmm. How do we know? Shenemar, as it's written, the sasa b'shalchatari vena, that when a, pers- a person receives in measure what he measures out, how do we know? Sa by sa, she requires for it, you should fight with her, meaning that's the case. So then the Gemara says, all right, that's great, ainly el That's on the big things, right? Sa's a huge measure. Minayan, the Rabos, Tarkov, the Chatsi Tarkov. How do I know that it includes a three cob measure and a 1.5 cob measure and a cob measure and a Chatsi, the Rovikov, the all of the other smaller measures? How do we know that it's not just big picture, but small pictures also? So the Gemara tries to prove that. But this is the locus classis for this idea of measure for measure. The sa, the sa, the sa, sa, which is this idea of this, this, this connected piece. And again, we see this, uh, this, this connection of that even that it's only measurement for measure that we get, that we get punched. Continues on, let's just go a little bit further. Um, new, this is the next part, lachen. Therefore, so this is how Jacob will purge his sin. Um, and this is how the, the all of the offspring, the pre, again, this continued metaphor of the fruit will remove its uh its uh its guilt, its sin. The sumo called name is Bea, and they give me the vatsos, the Yukuma Asherima Hamanim, when they're no longer. Or any of the idolatry and the the uh, cultic foreign cultic worship idols, idolatry and uh, 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 sherim are like the like the 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 worship uh, outposts. Um, Ki ir bitzura badad nave mushlach v'neazav kamidbar sham yira egel v'sham yirbos v'chilase ufah. What will happen? Ki ir bitzura badad. A fortified city, if they don't do tshuva, will be badad. Badad is lone, desolate, left alone. Nave, a uh, uh, a uh, a beautiful area will be considered uh, uh, forsaken, left. Then um, coming bar, left like a wilderness, like a desert. It will be like empty, plowed over. People will graze, uh, animals will graze there and lie down there, and they, they'll consume the seafim, are like the thickets, the thorns that grow out. There'll be uh, there'll be nothing there, right? So what's the Vos Kitsura to Shavarna? Um, it's crowned, will have this beautiful crown on its head, will be withered. And break the shimba od mirotota. Women will come and burn it, right? It's like uh, nothing. Same kilo ambinotu, for there are people without wisdom. Alkain lo yirachameu oseu. Therefore, God will show them no mercy. Their maker will not show them no mercy. Yotzro lo yichanenu, and the creator will deny them any grace. Meaning, do tshuva, and if you don't do tshuva, this will happen. So again, we're divided between Rashi. And the attack. Rashi thinks that this is targeting the Jewish people. If you don't do X, then I'm sorry, the opposite. Rashi says it's all about the enemy. If you don't do, if 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 you're this is all the redemptive period, right? Before was the bad time. Now this is a redemptive period. Your enemy who treated you this way, but God will now be left out. They are um, lo ambinotu. They are an ignorant nation. They don't have tfuna. They don't have knowledge. Again, remember the first verse of this Torah is that play on words. Tivuna, right? Knowledge, wisdom, tivuna, right? Uh, uh, the produce. Uh, it's the company in Israel, right? Tenuva. Is the is the milk company in Israel right? It's it's the same. It's the same. They're playing with those those words. It sounds like wisdom, right? Or the Radak says no. 
This is what happens to the Jewish people if you don't do tshuva. Ir bitsura badad. A fortified city will be desolate, meaning that could happen to you. Do tshuva, right? And this becomes, this is actually a manifestation of another debate that we had in, uh, in, in Hazinu, in the book of Devarim, Hazinu chapter 38, verse, let's say... Uh, verse 28. Ki goy oved etzot hema. They are a, a nation that lacks um, uh, wisdom, devoid of, of sefo. Ve'in tivuna. And they don't have any knowledge, any wisdom. So the Gemara in Mesechet, uh, or I'm sorry, the Midrash, based on the Gemara, argues who is this referring to? Rabbi Yehuda says, Doreshet Klape Yisrael. This is about the Jewish people. Hazinu is a reminder, do tshuva. If you don't do tshuva, you lose, you, you, you're going to go into exile, it'll be, you'll lose your, 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 your chance. The Rabbi Nechemia, Rabbi Nechemia teaches, Doresh Klape Aumo. No, it's actually about the nations of the world. Right? And again, this is exactly the same debate we're having right here between the Zach and Rashi. Is this about the Jewish people? Or is this a promise in redemption that this will happen to the non-Jews? Let's go on, pushing a little bit further in off Torah. Vayaba Yomaho, redemption. And you can see different through lines why it would make sense for Rashi to say that this is all about the enemy. Because look at this next line. It will be on that great day. God will smite all the people from the channel of the Euphrates, from the Euphrates River, until Nachal Mitzrayim, until the Wadi of Egypt. What's the Wadi of Egypt? The Nile River, the Wadi of Egypt. V'atem telukatu lechad echad Israel, And you will be picked up, plucked up one by one, O Jewish people. You'll be returned. Redemption is coming. Vayabah Yomahu, and that day, Yitzhakab Shofar Gadol, the Shofar will blow, uh, a great shofar, Uvoa of Dim Eretz Ashur, and the, uh, the, uh, those who are lost or exiled to Assyria will be brought back. This is a reference to the ten tribes. Van Yidachim the Eretz Mitzrayim, potentially. Van Yidachim the Eretz Mitzrayim, and those that are scattered to Eretz Mitzrayim will be brought back. We understand now a little bit why this connects to our partial also, uh, bringing back the Jews from exile. Hashem Kodesh And they'll all bow down to Yerushalayim, to God, in the holy uh, city in Yerushalayim, on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Everyone with me so far? Now, we're very familiar with this verse, right? We say it, I'm Rosh Hashanah, in Shofrot, it's part of a song. But we actually miss that there's a really powerful uh, piece here that we that we um, for, take for granted because we know this first. Yeshayahu is the first person to christen. I'm allowed to use that word. The shofar as a symbol, as a instrument of redemption. This idea that the shofar gadol yitaka on the day of redemption that Mashiach will be heralded by a shofar is unique to Yeshayahu. This is where this image begins to take root. There are other moments of it, Kol Mvaser, Harim, all of those ideas and the metaphors that the messenger of Mashiach is going to blow a shofar stems from this part, from this parak, from this pasuk. This is where it's born. This is where it's born. We, we, you're so familiar with the verse, we take it for granted. We think of the shofar in lots of contexts, right? It's the sound of theophany, of God's revelation, at Har Sinai, it's the sound of war, right? When the Jews gather to go to war, they blow the shofar. Think about surrounding Yericho. Think about bringing the camps together. It's the sound of joy and jubilation on holidays and different celebrations. Now it's also the sound of the Messiah. It's the soundtrack of the Messiah. And that comes up in this Torah for the first time. Um, and again, we have to we ask ourselves, well, why are we reading this Torah in our Parsha? So we already noted that we're following the national through line. Part of this national through line is this recognition that the redemption that started in Egypt never stopped. 
that that redemption continues and that Rav, to borrow beautiful language of Rav Cook, that the world bends and constantly moves towards the redeemed state. We're constantly moving. Redemption is constantly happening. All of that is part of this vision. All the way from the original people who were sent back from Egypt. That they'll come to Jerusalem and they'll celebrate the final redemption. It will be as if it's one long redemptive spark all the way from Jacob in Egypt to the final redemption. And what will, what will be the soundtrack of that moment? The shofar. Um, and now we understand, just to quickly wrap up, now we understand number one, what's going on here with our Hatora, why it's here. Number two, we understand a little bit this debate between the Radak and Rashi. On the one hand, there are different pieces that push us chapter five, to make this think about that this is a positive spin on that initial uh, image. And then Rashi sees this as being drawn from verse 12 and 13 of this chapter, that this is all about some end of days, do tshuva, and if not, this is what can happen. So we actually, there it's hard to put them together. You can understand how the Radak and Rashi both need to sort of contend with the variables. They're going to choose some of them to be primary, and they're going to work out the other ones. Um, there's a lot more to talk about. Next year, we're going to talk about the second half of the Torah, which is a new chapter and a new discussion, which we're not going to have time to get to right now. But we're going to stop here. We have 20 minutes for Israel from Israel in a moment. So I'm going to pause the recording and let people in.